calling all mental health providers. Looking to specialize in treating adolescents? Check out PsychUp's Cognitive Behavioral Therapy courses. Receive specialized certifications and hone in on your skills. Get one year access to patient videos and worksheets that you can email or text to your clients to keep them engaged in between sessions. Plus, you'll be placed on the PsychUp registry where consumers of mental health who are searching for certified providers that are specialized in their condition can find you. To learn more about CBT for adolescent training, visit psychhub.com learning. Hi, I'm Marjorie Morrison. And this is Patrick Kennedy. And you are listening to the Psych Hub podcast, the future of mental health. Guys, this may be my favorite episode yet. And I know I say that almost every week, but this subject is something that I'm really, really passionate about. Being a licensed marriage family therapist, I have seen so many relationships destroyed because of lack of intimacy. Sex addiction is real. I cannot tell you how many people have confided in me about this. I've received more feedback on this subject and have had so many people tell me how grateful they were for us at Psych Hub to lean in on sex and porn addiction. In addition to putting together this podcast, we've developed a series of short animated videos on this topic and are developing a behavioral health provider certified sex therapist learning hub around it. This has been a very taboo subject, but it's that much more important that we all tackle it. I am so grateful to have Dr. Ken Rosenberg here with us today. He is a psychiatrist and the author of Infidelity, Why Men and Women Cheat. I can't wait for you to dive in and learn why some people who have seemingly great marriages, families, and careers but behind closed doors lead completely different lives. We'll cover what's a healthy amount of porn, when you've crossed the line from healthy sex to unhealthy behaviors, and a lot more. If you like what you hear from Dr. Rosenberg on our podcast today, check out the short animated videos we created with him. One is called, What is Sex Addiction? Another is, How to Overcome Sex and Love Addiction? And, What Causes Sex Addiction? You can find them on our Psych Hub website or on our YouTube channel. Let's dive in. I'm excited. Well, first of all, thank you, Ken, for joining us. This is a, a long anticipated podcast. The issue of uh, sex addiction is, is so taboo, but it's obviously pretty prevalent. I mean, and we're anxious in the course of the podcast to get your take on some of the new phenomena that is really driving the increased prevalence of this, none the least of which is the kind of ubiquitous uh, access to pornography that now is like on your phone, you know, just everywhere. And uh, and it's it calls to mind kind of the more basic question about process addictions, uh, food addictions, uh, gambling addictions. And of course, you know, we've got online gaming. So that's going to become an increase of a problem for our public health. You know, you've got the technology addiction in general, you know, and of course, we've got an uptick in alcohol use and um, benzodiazepines and things, of course, as a result of COVID and, and the people's interest in trying to self-medicate the huge stress and anxiety and Uh, that's come from this pandemic. The reason I want to lump all of that together is because I often find in in my world of politics, people identify addiction by the particular disorder, i.e., you know, opioid use disorder. Oh, it's an opioid crisis. I I mean, I was someone who was addicted to Oxycontin. My crisis was not opioids it was everything uh, uh, and and yet you know we end up trying to simplify all these things when in fact there are kind of lots of uh, overlapping addictions and if you could basically talk to us a l- little bit about how that happens um yes. and as, as i said the mechanisms of addiction whether they be process addictions uh, like sex addiction or whether they're substance use you know alcohol addictions. Well, as always, Patrick, you summarize things brilliantly. And, uh, you, you know, you're right. Our society is conspiring to create much more business for people like me. Who are, I'm an addiction psychiatrist. And unfortunately, and I do think it's terribly unfortunate, we have now, you know, an in- uptick, as you say, in opiates, cocaine, marijuana is being introduced to the mix. 
uh, whatever your feelings are about legalization, we will undoubtedly have more people who have problems with marijuana. We will undoubtedly have more youth who, with their developing brains, have exposure to something which surely, for a small number of them, will open a window onto psychosis, mental illness, that would otherwise have been closed. But when you talk about process addictions, you're absolutely right. You know, the, the, the real advance in the thinking about addiction scientifically and societally is that addictions are pretty much the same. You know, we ad- ad- evolved as animals to become addicted to certain behaviors. Otherwise, our species would not survive. We did not evolve to be addicted to opiates or alcohol. We actually evolved to be addicted to food and sex and things that were critical for our survival. Uh, And we didn't, you know, when we evolved, there weren't refrigerators, there weren't processed foods, there wasn't, you know, uh, what we call uh, hedonistic foods available in packaging where people could, you know, drive in and and get, you know, super big meals. Um, And we did not evolve with porn on our phones. Uh, you know, the average age of porn exposure is 11 years old. That's going to create a lot of sex addicts. Uh, so you're absolutely right. The fundamental idea that addictions are similar, uh, whether it's a behavioral addiction, that means an addiction to a behavior like food uh, or sex, or whether we're talking process addictions is the word you use. That's the word we used to use about 10 or 20 years ago. Or whether we're talking about substance use disorders, which is cocaine, opiates, that sort of thing. Um, And what does that mean? That means essentially that the brain, the mind, if you will, becomes hijacked. That the reward systems are ignited. Those deep systems in our brain that were there for us to be addicted to, as I say, food and sex and do these things whenever we had the opportunity. Uh, Those reward systems in all addictions, whether you're talking about opiates or alcohol or sex, those reward systems become ignited. The dopamine centers that we talk about in the deep centers, the pleasure centers, the limbic centers of the brain, those dopamine releasing centers. And what we also have in addictions is a hijacking of the frontal lobe. So we have the reward system is ignited, and then we have the processing, the thinking, the executive functioning system in the front of our brains and our more mammalian, more recent brains is hijacked. So that's what happens in addiction. And I think that for the most part, anyone could be addicted to most anything. Certainly, if I have lots of drinks every night, if I have lots of opiates every day, I will physiologically, psychologically, mentally become addicted. If all I know for sex is porn, if all I know is a certain kind of sexual behavior, uh, we could get into those, that kind of captivates my brain for whatever reason, I'll become addicted to that. You know, I I think that there are certainly people who, because of their psychological and biological vulnerabilities, become addicted to certain things. But I would say that we're all capable just as we're all capable of having psychiatric illness, frankly, we're all capable of becoming addicts of one sort or another, if given the opportunity, the right circumstances, the right biology, and the right stimuli. It really does seem like the young adolescent brain is just being assaulted at every vector. And uh, there seems to be an absolute kind of disregard for the long-term sacrifice uh, for our country by allowing our young people to kind of get exposed to so much at a time when they're so anxious. And we're seeing kids suffer uh, tremendously, obviously, because they're disconnected since they're so overconnected technologically. And then, of course, COVID further isolates them and they're trying to work through all this. And yet they've got lots of escapes. Well, I think that you make a very, very good point. Again, you know, you're talking about the what makes something addictive. Well, what makes something addictive is you need the biological template. And by virtue of us being human, we have the biological ability. Now, some of us, for genetic biological reasons, are more prone to want upper drugs. Uh, some of my patients want to be down, want to be 
have all their anxiety and all their extreme racing of their mind be brought down by opiates or alcohol. So you need the biological temperament, but you bring up such an important idea, which is you also need accessibility, availability, and affordability. And the more these things are accessible, the more things are available, the more things uh, are affordable, and the more they could be used anonymously then people really will gravitate towards those. You also bring up another point, which is you know very near and dear to my heart, that I think that when we're talking about addiction, who do we want to spare the most? We want to spare those people with developing brains and developing habits. A lot of my patients who I treat who have sexual compulsivity develop these habits early on. And I have to say, you could modify sexual behavior. But once you have a certain fantasy, that gets kind of deeply embedded in your brain. So the earlier that happens in the process, the harder it is for us working in recovery to undo the damage. Um, developing brains are very, very vulnerable. We know that the brain goes through a process of development up until early 20s. We know that in the early 20s, the brain goes through a process of pruning, getting rid of those things that we don't need. And then we're left with a more basic structure. And we know that's a very, very vulnerable period. We know that, those early 20s, that's the age when anxiety disorder set in, when uh, serious mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder sets in. So this is a very, very vulnerable time biologically and sociologically for, for people to get exposed to these harsh and addictive substances. You know... I'm all for free speech. I'm all for people, uh, if they could manage it using whatever drugs, as long as it doesn't hurt anyone. But I think there is a subpopulation that I see who will be destroyed by these behaviors and by these drugs. And those are the young people who I worry about. Ken, that, this is all fascinating to me. I, I want to talk a little bit more about porn and, and sex, can you help us understand, because I think there's so much confusion, right? We know that there's this huge uptick in porn consumption, and you just laid it out you know, really, really well. You articulated what, what that can do to the brain. What is the, so I have a few questions for you. What is the difference between porn addiction and sex addiction? And you know, are, are they interdependent? And I think the, the thing I really am super interested in and want to talk about is what happens, so I'm loading you up with two questions here to just go fire and go, but what happens to a person who, which I hear this all the time, who is so used to, as you called it, getting off or finishing through porn, that it's very hard for them to have what might be considered healthy sexual intercourse and finishing that way. And and is that part of that or is that a separate issue? Uh, it's all combined. So porn addiction is one kind of sex addiction, and it's a very common kind of sex addiction for the reasons we just spoke about, Marjorie, because porn is very accessible, very cheap. It costs nothing. All you have to do is have a phone, which everyone has now. Um, and it's very satisfying in a way because you could, you know, go off here on your own masturbate and have have your orgasm and and you're you're done and but it's also very very addictive you know people will my porn patients will spend hours searching just for the right moment right for the right video for the right situation and they'll and those you know and they'll be in this state of what we call flow where time collapses you know if you're ever doing anything that you love like a sports event or or, uh, or or some kind of activity that you really adore, you know, time collapses. You're like, I, I can't believe I've been, you know, at this restaurant for three hours. I thought I was here for five minutes because I'm so engaged with my friends and my, my the food. Well, that's how it is for my porn addicts. They get so engaged, so in loss that they'll spend hours and hours. But porn addiction is one of the many forms of sex addiction. It is perhaps the most common now, but there are other forms. Massage powers are very common these days. You know, in New York City, where I practice and live, in almost every other corner, you'll see a place that's a massage power. And if you, if you know what you're looking for, because you treat people like this, you know that, you know, when you see a sign 
that it, that there's there's a massage there, but there really is a sexual thing happening there. Um, fetishistic behaviors are part of the sex addictions. Uh, what are fetishistic behaviors? People who can only get excited or mainly get excited by a foot, by a shoe, uh, by uh, you know a certain kind of behavior th- that. And that's all their repertoire, their entire sexual repertoire is wrapped around that one thing. So it could be porn, it could be a fetishistic inanimate object, it could be a, a, a single sexual act. Um, and those are the kinds of sex addictions. You know, what happens, to, to answer your second question, Marjorie, what happens with these folks? They get so consumed by it. It's not just like, uh, I like to do this, but I can live without it. It's like, I need this for me to function, for me to feel like a human being, for me to feel satisfied. I need to have that shoe. I need to have pornography. I need to have something to get excited, to get off, if you will, other than my partner. And of course, it detracts from a, from a relationship. You know, as we all know, relationships are hard. They take work. We as human beings like novelty. We like things that are exciting. We like something new. We don't like to go to the same restaurant over and over again. And unfortunately, you know, our partners sometimes are not exciting. You know, after 10, 20 years, it's like you again. You know, it's not so uh, brand new. However, relationships take work. And, and that kind of, when people are having that instant gratification from porn uh, or massage power, they're really, it interferes with their ability to make themselves available for healthier sex and healthier relationships. You know, I think that these things are very similar to eating disorders and eating issues because abstinence is very hard, right? I mean, if, if sex is a part of a healthy life, and I think that, you know, most of us would agree that that's a, that's a beautiful part of life. So what is it like to treat somebody who has a sex addiction because it's not like, you know, as Patrick would talk about with um, substance use or where it's abstinence is the answer. So I would imagine it's more complicated. Can you share a little bit about what the treatment's like? Absolutely. Well, it's actually not that complicated because what people define as problematic sex and what they define for themselves, not that I define, what they define for themselves as healthy sex is often pretty clear. So people will say, you know, when I go to porn, that's for me, an unhealthy place because it's a place where I live and I can't escape it. Uh, when I go to a massage power, that's an unhealthy place for me. It's illegal. It's for me, it's against my you know, morals. It, for, for many reasons, it's not where I want to be. Um, when I have any kind of sex with my partner, whether it's whatever kind of sexual position it might be, whatever kind of sexual behavior it might be, Someone might say, well, that's a healthy thing. I have many patients who are polyamorous. And so it's not, you know, it's not a monogamous, heteronormative thing that they're searching for. But still, it's often clear what is a problematic behavior and what is for them a healthy behavior. Uh, So what does abstinence look like? It means avoiding those things that are problematic. If you're addicted to porn, sorry, porn is off the menu. Um, if you're addicted to prostitutes or the prostitutes is what gets you in trouble, that's off the menu. And often we need to help people not only stay away from things, move away from things. We always talk in addiction about whether we're moving away or moving towards. We kind of want to keep them away from things that get them in trouble, but we want to help facilitate them get the things that are very useful. So in a healthy relationship for them, again, as they define it, in a healthy sexual encounter, whether it's, you know, with a partner or three partners, however they define healthy sex, we want to help them with that. And we want to, you know, work on their sexual disorders, which often happen as well as their sexual uh, addictions. So let me speak about that for a moment. If someone has a sex addiction, they're compulsively doing something which is making them unhappy, which at the end of it, after they orgasm often, they're so full of remorse, so full of regret. They, they go to, to their church or synagogue and pray immediately that they will never do that again. Um, but with their partner, they may also have a problem because they might also have a sexual disorder 
that makes it a little bit harder. You know, once you are addicted to use a crude example to chocolate ice cream, it's very, very hard to, you know, eat carrots and broccoli. So it's how sometimes we have to help people do things that are maybe not as exciting and thrilling. And as we said earlier, don't capture that reward system, you know, don't have that dopamine firing in their brain. And how do we do that? We, you know, we, we sometimes we have to work biologically, giving help, helping people have uh, sex. Sometimes we have to give men Viagra or erectogenics to help them with performance anxiety. Very, very common that my sex addicts who are great in the, you know, great in the dark alleys are terrible in the bedroom. So they often need some help and coaching in the bedroom um, to, so, so they could get some help with that. So we, it's a two-pronged approach. Uh, we have to help them with what ails them and help facilitate what they define. I can't emphasize that enough what they define as good, healthy sexual behavior. Whether you treat mental health or you just want to learn more about your own mental health, PSYCUP has educational resources for anyone and everyone in between. If you're a provider looking to get trained in cognitive behavioral therapy or want to help out a family member or colleague, our specialized certifications give you in-demand skills and boost your qualifications. Plus, they are self-paced so you can take them on your own schedule. Visit psychhub.com slash learning to get started. I think that really leads me to another question then is the partner. And, uh, and I do appreciate all this. So, you know, it's, it's common and I speak and Patrick might have a different opinion. I speak from the, you know, a female voice where sometimes, you know, the female has a different lens and all this, not that, you know, females are also can be addicted to porn and sex and all that. But I think what happens to females a lot is that if we feel rejected because of these issues, it creates this kind of vicious cycle. And so I'm curious, what kind of advice do you give the partners to not personalize it as much? Or do you see that and, um, and how, how they can be supportive and helpful? Well, partners often uh, personalize it. I mean, it's very, very hard when you discover that not only have you not been having sex for four or five years, but that your partner has been going and doing this every week or twice a week or three times a week with their phone with another person. I mean, that's a very, very hard pill to swallow, so to speak. Very, very challenging. It's impossible not to take that personally. But I think when we educate partners about the paradigm of sexual addiction or what we now call compulsive sexual behavior disorder, when we educate them about that paradigm, it helps them not take it personally. It helps them know that their partner has a problem. Um, gets them off the hook a little bit, if you will, but it helps them understand that, you know, this is an illness. This is an addiction. It's no more personal than if they're doing opiates or, you know, drinking late at night. This is what their, their, their uh, compulsion is. It also helps if, if their partner, the sex addict partner, says, I feel terrible, I won't do this, I'll get help by any means necessary. You know, if the partner says, this is what I like to do, you gotta live with it, you as the, uh, as, as the afflicted partner, that's a bad position to be in. And, and honestly, sometimes you have to make a decision. Is that really the kind of relationship you, you want? But if you have a partner who now is in individual therapy, taking medication if need be, in group therapy, Go into 12-step recovery. There's some great groups, by the way. Sex Acts Anonymous, Sex and Love Acts Anonymous, uh, you know, or two of the three groups there. If you have your partner who's identified this as a problem, says they love you, is dedicated towards you, it makes it much easier. I really think this is fascinating. And I think it affects more of us than, than we know. Um, and one of the issues is there's so much shame that people don't really want to talk about it. And, uh, and they're embarrassed. So it's, it's almost like by the time they get to you, it's a problem and they're ready to fix it. I'm just, I, I believe that there are so many people that are in this zone of not knowing if it's a problem. And, you know, I, I think it's interesting that you talked about the porn and the hours that you could spend getting ready for it. And I don't know, I'm 
I'm curious how much of it is a time commitment of how long it is, but also frequency. Because I hear, I ask people these conversations all the time and I'm stunned. I just was with a group of people Saturday night and I didn't even bring it up. I swear the whole conversation of porn came up and and I think I was with six six males in our group and they were all talking about how how frequent they've used and since COVID, how much more frequently, you know, to the to the point like one of them was three, four times a day. That's not uncommon. You know, it is interesting the amount of time people spend on their compulsive sexual behaviors. You know, if you're a guy, your orgasm lasts four seconds, if you're lucky, five seconds, but you spend hours and hours and hours searching for this, these images and trying to get it. The intrigue is really much, you know, much more of a problem, if you will, than the, than, than the orgasm experience. So you, people spend a lot of time. That's part of what defines it as an addiction, right, Marjorie? You spend more time than you ever thought. You know, you're, this is the focus of your existence. You can't wait until you get to your phone. You can't wait until your partner goes to sleep. You can't, you know, uh, you, you, I have executives who spend their days, they, they lock themselves in their office. They, 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 you know, shut their door, pull down the blinds, whatever. And they'll spend an hour or two in the middle of the day with pornography. I have many people who will spend an hour or two going to a massage power in the middle of the day. As dangerous as that might be for them on so many levels, and as much of a time sucker that it is, they will you know, spend so much time doing it. So that's part of what defines as addiction. It, you, 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 you are just consumed with this. It's a, it's a focus for you. And very importantly, as you're suggesting, Marjorie, it interferes with your relationships. It interferes with your work and interferes with your primary or family relationships. How much of this is escape from other things going on in their lives? And this is a a coping mechanism for that. Or the physiological addiction of the more you do it, the more you need it and it becomes habitual. Well, I think it's both. I mean, I think that's one of the things that characterizes addiction. It is a way to escape, or as I would say, and maybe Patrick would say, self-medicated dysphoric feeling or self-medicated anxiety or self-medicated boredom. It's very, very common that a lot of my sex addict patients also have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. They have very you know, low thresholds for uh, boredom and they, uh, they, they crave excitement. Um, so uh, I think that it's part, you know, it's, it's both. So, uh, Ken, you made some mention to 12-step recovery. Can you identify kind of what about 12-step recovery is very helpful in um, people gaining recovery from sex oh, addiction? Sure. Yes, of course. Well, you know this so well. Uh, I mean, what, what do we get from 12-step recovery? We get guidance. We get a spiritual awakening. Uh, you know, you don't have to believe in God. You could just believe in some higher power that could even be evolution you know you could be something greater than yourself and you get fellowship you get other people who are in the same situation who could call you out on your stuff who could say no no, no, you're not telling us the truth here the truth is you did x y and z because you were you know they know this they they know they've been there done that so you get some really great fellowship and you get friendship and you're, you, you get a sense that you're in it together with people who are now recovered, which is very hopeful. You know, the worst thing about uh, being sick is feeling alone and hopeless. And if you could feel that you're, you're not alone, uh, there, are, there are other people like you. And not only are they like you, but they've conquered this problem. They are now in recovery. They're not cured of it, but they manage it successfully and they have good sex lives and they have healthy relationships and they're not, you know, t- taking hours away from their jobs or their families to do these shenanigans. That's extremely helpful. And of course, the 12 step has incredible, incredible guidance. You know, the 12 steps are all, are kind of good for any problem. You know, the idea of accepting what you can, you know, need to accept and changing what you can and knowing the difference, the idea of one uh, one day at a time, all these lessons of 12-step recovery are very, very useful for anyone. You don't have to be an addict. In fact, one of the best things about being an addict is, is you now have an invitation to this incredible group, which helps you with lessons in, in life. 
can you dive into that other aspect of sex addiction, which is addiction to relationships? Yeah. So SLA, for instance, SLAA, Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, not only has to do with addiction to sexual behaviors that get you in trouble, but addiction to relationships and love relationships that get you in trouble. And there are many of us, a uh, few of us, in fact, who don't crave a primary relationship. And when deprived of that, well, you know, the great lengths and sometimes destructive lengths and get into bad relationships. So one of the things these, uh, these organizations deal with is not just the sexual behavior that gets you in trouble, but the emotional relationships that get you in trouble. Uh, we haven't spoken about it, but when we talk about sex addiction and we talk about infidelity, we have to also speak about emotional affairs. Sometimes people get intimately involved with other folks uh, uh, where there's a sexual spark, where there's a sexual desire, but sex really never happens. It's an emotional connection. And people are so engaged with someone else other than their primary partner in a way that they talk about their partner to them. They tell secrets. They share things. They say, oh, my God, you're the greatest. I'm so glad I could talk to you. Why can't I talk to my wife or my husband about that? Those kinds of emotional affairs are very, very damaging. Uh, in fact, they might even be more damaging. When you ask women who are smarter than us, Patrick, as we know, when you ask women what's worse, a sexual affair or emotional affair, they rightly say an emotional affair. Men say it's a sexual affair, but you know they're wrong, as they often are. Women say it's that emotional affair. And these emotional affairs are very destructive. And that's why in recovery, you don't just work on... Uh, you know, the sex stuff, you work on the emotional stuff and the connection stuff and the relationships. And as I said earlier, it's not just the sex acts that get you in trouble. An orgasm, again, it, it lasts a few seconds. But that intrigue, that desire, that connection, whether it's to a, a, a person or an idea or a fetishistic idea or a prostitute, that emotional intrigue, and that emotional connection, that relationship connection, that's what really gets us in trouble. So you can't just work on what happens when, you know, when you're having sex. You have to work on what's going on relationship-wise in your mind, if you will. Can you talk a little bit about that idea of risk-taking as, as, as part of the process? Yeah, super interesting. Uh, there's a whole theory, which I, I believe that people who are sex addicts, people who often are drug addicts, people who get involved in these impulsive and dangerous, sometimes dangerous behaviors, are people who need a whole lot of stimulation. In fact, one of the ideas, and supported by research, is that there are people who need more dopamine to satisfy themselves. You know, we, we think of it as a well, like a water well, right? There are some wells that you just fill it up with a little bit of water and you're done. You know, you have, a, you have some kind of exciting experience, some kind of interesting experience, and you're done for the day. There are other people whose wells, dopamine wells, if you will, excitement wells, are very, very deep. And they need a lot of excitement, a lot of crazy stuff, if you will, to fill that well. And some of my sex addict patients are, you know, are commonly those folks those folks who need a lot of excitement to fill what I would call their dopamine well. And that's why we know other illnesses that are associated with this impulsivity and this risk-taking, like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADD, ADHD, those are commonly associated with sex addiction and commonly associated with addiction because they're people who, who they like to take risks. You know, they're not, they're not afraid of driving at 120 miles an hour. They're not afraid of trying a new drug. They're not afraid of going to you know, some really bizarre underground sexual place. They're, you know, that turns them on. In fact, they kind of need it because they're dopamine well, as I would say. You know, uh, and it is a scientific, uh, scientific concept, but their dopamine well is so deep, they need lots of excitement to fill that up. So impulsivity goes very much with all these things we're talking about. In fact, the compulsive sexual behavior disorder in the ICD-11, the new diagnostic category, is included as an impulsive disorder, not as a sexual disorder, not as an addiction disorder. 
So there's a lot of congruence between impulsivity and addictions. Do you anticipate would be the kind of spectrum of treatment options for people with sex addiction going forward now with the ICD-11 listing? What would what are you seeing in terms of the different types of approaches? Of course, you know with with rest of addiction, you know there's a kind of a ASAM criteria. They kind of risk stratify you know, the dimensions of your addiction, how long, you know, what the, this and that different characteristics. Um, will we do the same in, in this? Uh, yeah, it's pretty much treatment for, this, for this. Yeah. Condition. I mean, I think that all, you know, um, in, in this stuff I've been writing about, uh, all my ideas are based on my training as an addiction psychiatrist. I should say I trained as an addiction psychiatrist. And I also at Cornell where, where I did my residency and fellowship. And I also trained in sexual disorders. And by the way, my teachers in sexual disorders and my teachers in chemical addictions agreed on one thing, that there was no such thing as a sex addiction, uh, which was, you know, I just think at the time that I trained, people didn't appreciate that. Now we know there is such a thing. And the treatment of sexual compulsivity or hypersexuality, as it's also known, or sex addiction, as we're speaking about, is pretty much based on the addiction paradigm. It's based on 12-step recovery, getting involved in one of these groups we talked about, SA, SAA, or SLAA. It's also based on psychotherapy, which gets at the roots. We talked about it over and over again. The, the, what is it you're trying to get away from? What is you're trying to deal with? What is you're trying to self-medicate? It's based on group therapy. I have a group in my practice in which men I get together and talk about their sex addiction with other men. I, I lead that group. And it's also based on you know, biological treatments. We have uh, some really decent biological treatments. Now, we have no FDA-approved treatment for sexual compulsivity, but for better or for worse, all the psychiatric drugs attenuate, decrease sex, the sexual desire so they can be used for compulsivity. The SSRIs, drugs like Prozac and Zoloft, are very, very good at, at treating compulsivity. Um, there are other drugs that are very good at treating addiction, a drug called naltrexone, which I'm sure you, you all have heard of, is a drug that's used for opiate addiction and now FDA approved for, for alcohol addiction. is also very useful for the behavioral addictions, gambling and sex. Um, and you know, essentially the biological treatment, the psychopharmacologic treatment for sex addiction is to, to treat things that will help people move towards a healthy sexual encounter and away from that compulsive thing that is ruining their life. So as I said earlier, sometimes we have to give people medications that might help them with their partners. Um, people might get very excited with the fetishistic object, with the porn, with something on their phone, but they don't get so excited when their partner's in the room. Say so they may need some help with that. They may even need an erectogenic, a drug like Viagra to help them so that they can perform in their sexual situation with a partner and not be you know, so uh, demoralized and their partner is not so demoralized. Uh, and we also have to educate people, a lot of, a lot of psychoeducation that, as Marjorie said, you know, how do you take this not personally? Well, one of the ways you not take this whole thing personally is understanding it not as a rejection, but as a problem or even as an illness. So Ken, I think this has been really helpful. I know we're uh, wrapping up, but I wanted to ask you to think a little bit about what would a new world look like where we really worked on preparing the public for a better appreciation for all of these subjects, particularly about yeah. brain health and yeah. neuroliteracy and thinking about how our brains become wired for self-destructive behavior and how it is that we can, from an earlier age in life, uh, get ourselves more prepared to, to navigate, you know, all the challenges, uh, you know, traumas and the like that can end up with, um, you know, hardwiring of fixed notions that end up really sidetracking people for a better part of their lives in terms of these obsessions, sure. compulsions, and addictions? Well, very simply, we have to talk about it. 
exactly what you're doing now, exactly what you're creating with, you know, Psych Hub. We have to talk about it because as James, James Baldwin said, I love to quote James Baldwin, you know, we can't fix everything, but we sure as heck can't fix anything unless we talk about it, unless we face it. And that's what, you know, we're doing now during this, this hour. We're trying to face it and talk about it. So I think we have to prepare people by making them aware. Marjorie said so, 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 uh, so succinctly, the problem is shame. The biggest obstacle we know in, in taking care of people with any kind of psychiatric illness is not necessarily the illness or the treatment's availability. It's the shame that makes them go underground and hide. So we have to talk about it. Um, and I think we also have to realize that accessibility, affordability, availability, those things we talked about are real issues. Should we really be making porn available to 11-year-olds? Should we make misogynistic porn available as it is? Should we have, you know, legalized marijuana? These are conversations we need to have. You know, we err on the side of civil liberties. That's great. Uh, but we need to also err on the side of preventing people from destroying themselves because of the nature of who we are. And I think that's a, that's a very complicated conversation, but it's one that needs to happen. You know, whenever we talk about these things, we always talk about free speech. But what we don't talk about is potential harm that could happen when people are exposed early on to drugs, alcohol, and, and inappropriate, I would say inappropriate, and I, I largely misogynistic sexual stimuli. Ken, this was really, really interesting, thoughtful, impactful, and I have no doubt that it will touch more lives than we realize or people because so many, like we talked about, so many people are, are dealing with this, whether in private or with their just group of friends, whether their group of guy friends or their group of girlfriends or whatever. So I really, I appreciate your, the history that you have into this, that you come in as a, a true, true expert and specialist and that you've spent your career working on these things. I mean, just hearing alone that the one common thing at Cornell was that that there was no such thing as as sex is not being an addiction. And one of the questions I was going to ask you as we're running out of time was, are you seeing it more prevalent now? Um, but I think that we are seeing it. If now we're getting it, we're getting that diagnosis. Yes. Oh, yes. I well, look, it's hard to assess prevalence because uh, people are now talking about and aware of it. However, as as we've been discussing with the availability of porn and uh, just and the early age of people get that porn becomes their major sexual outlet, we're certainly going to see, unfortunately, more sex addiction. Well, we're glad we have people like you out there that know how to treat this, know how to message it, and really know how to help. So thank you for your time. We, we loved having you. This was really great. And just keep doing the great work that you do. And it's an honor to be able to work alongside you. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. See you soon. All right. Thanks, Ken. What's cracking, Hope Nation? It's your friendly neighborhood, Kevin Hines. And here's the Psych Hub Brain Health Tip of the Week. Sleep is the most important part of your day. We spend a third of our lives in bed. There's more to sleep than just shutting down the brain. Without a good night's rest, we don't retain information as well. It impacts our mood, our motivation. With small changes, you can work your way to a healthier sleeping habit. Start your day the night before. Make a list of everything you need to do tomorrow before you go to sleep. That way you don't think about them throughout the, the night. Avoid light distractions and turn off the TV before bed and disconnect your devices. Stop drinking caffeine later in the day and don't eat too late. And if you can't sleep, get out of bed. You don't want a, a connection between your bed and the frustration to be able to sleep. Get up and do something for 20 minutes to get your mind off of, off of sleep before returning to bed. If all else fails and you persistently have trouble, Sleeping, talk to your mental health provider about insomnia. This can really help you find a way to a better sleep pattern, a better circadian rhythm. Thank you, everyone. Those were our Psych Hub Brain Health Tips of the Week. Wishing you well, take care, and be here tomorrow. As always, thank you for listening to our podcast. If you enjoyed the show, drop us a review. If you haven't already, subscribe to our podcast for the latest episodes. For the latest insights, check us out at psychhub.com.
You know that airplane metaphor of putting on your oxygen mask first before you help someone else? Mental health is no different. In order to take care of others, you have to help yourself first. But what does that look like? Take Psych Hub's Mental Health Ally certification for starters. It's eight one-hour courses covering anything and everything from substance use to diversity in mental health to suicide prevention and more. Plus, it's self-paced, so you could take it on your own schedule. Become a certified, trusted resource to come to for mental health concerns. Visit psychhub.com learning to get started.